Luke chapter 18 with a parable I dealt with just a few weeks ago. But even though I dealt with it a few weeks ago, it does not change the fact that we can look at things different ways. Chapter 18, verse 1. Are you there, Luke? You got your Bibles here? Raise it up. Got your Bible? No? Yes? No? Are you, are you awake? I know it's warm now. It's, it's, we got the air con to wake you up. Raise your Bibles up. All right, we're ready for action. And yes, when you have it on here, just keep Instagram at bay and all those uh, different video uh, channels and things like that away. And uh, let's go ahead and get into the Word of God, chapter 18, verse 1. Then Jesus told this parable to show them that they should always pray and never give up. In a certain town there was a judge who feared neither God nor people. There was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, grant me justice against my adversary, a widow. Grant me justice. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about what people think, yet because this widow keeps what? Bothering me. I will see that she gets justice so that she doesn't eventually come and doesn't say attack me in the original script. I know in the NIV it says attack me. It doesn't overwhelm me, meaning I'm not going to go crazy hearing about it, is what he basically says. And you know what that means. Here, Joe Lynn, let's follow me over here. You know, I'm going to use this bench. You know this? You ever heard that on your door? Ever heard that on the door? Huh? I know we don't want to answer the phone ever. We don't want to answer things. You get those phone calls? LAUSD? Hey, we have, uh, we have school that's free. You want to come free school? Free. Come. Come to free school. And we are always competing with the private schools. <laughs> anyway, that shows you something. But anyway, um, the deal is, is it just keeps coming. You get those, um, you know, the, the solar companies. Solar companies, you get at least two of them a week. Uh, credit card companies, oh, they love you. Oh, yes, let's get that credit rating up until you can't pay it anymore and the credit goes way down. It's the constant knocking that happens. The one that knocks is the one that gets, eventually. This is what Jesus is telling us. But I want you to think of this differently because, you know, all of us, when we read it, when I read it, I see in this the reality that God actually is telling us to be persistent, right? Do you see that message in it? Persistence. And we know that. I do construction at the church. Oh, I, we do construction, but a lot of times it's much of me involved in interconnecting the dots between people doing the job, the contractors, whatever, and our church body. And what our church body votes, right? Uh, persistence is key. Because you know when stuff like that is happening without being there every day dealing with it, stuff just occurs, right? And that's how life is. But if we're not persistent, it doesn't happen. So therefore, we're right. Jesus is talking to us. But... Let's switch it around. Are you in your bulletin? What's the name of the sermon? What's the title? What? The persistent what? Love of... I'd like you to look at a different way. Flip it for a second. The kingdom of heaven is powerful. We don't think it is. We think it's nothing because we ha do not have faith to think it matters. We think our local church is a nothing burger, usually. Usually we just try and try and nothing happens. But do you know, without you seeing it, when healthy churches start to happen, communities begin to change if that church is doing something that matters to the community. And it takes a very small amount of faith to make a bit of dough like yeast fill up with air. 
So in the same way, God tries with something very small like knocking on the door. In Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and what? Knock. He or she who opens the door, I want to come in and eat with you and you with me, Jesus says to the church of Laodicea. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles from this parable to another parable. It's in Luke chapter 15. One of my favorite parable chapters, Luke. Luke has a lot of good parables, and he, he looks at things the other way. You know, the book of Luke is the gospel of the underdog. You know what an underdog is, right? The underdog. I'm going to... Um, the underdog is always the one that always uh, doesn't get what he wants. He's the one everyone uh, does not see as a winner, but a loser. The, the, that church that everyone says ain't going to do nothing, or that, that person that everyone thinks is going to lose the run, right, in the race. Well, in Luke Every single thing that comes up is always the ones that the world looks at as nothing. And Jesus raises them up. Read with me. It's in Luke 15. Start with verse 8. Are you ready? Verse 8. Oftentimes we don't deal with this text. Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Now, silver... Which is more expensive, silver or gold? Yeah. So silver coins. And, and by the way, the silver coin that actually is delineated here is something because Luke was communicating not just to the Israelites, but actually he was communicating to the Greeks and Persians, all of those people who were outside of Judaism in the world. And ancient world, and I couldn't find it. The museum is getting set up. Half of it is done. I am working at it one step at a time. Speaking about persistence. Every time I schedule a day to work on the museum, that means something happens, and for four hours I have to do something else, and then eventually I get back to it. But in that museum I have some coins. They're about this big, and they have a little hole in the middle of it. Have you seen coins like that? If you go to Asia, go to the Middle East, you'll find those coins. Even in the Philippines, there's a few, I think. No, none in the Philippines. There's some square or oblong. I have some awesome, the two, the two uh, peso coin. I love that one. Um, but there's ones that have the hole in the middle. Not in the Philippines, but in Asia, you'll find these. And in Persia. You know what that hole is for? To hang it. You could hang it on your belt. But in the case of a woman who has received a dowry from being married, oftentimes you wear that coin as jewelry in the ancient world. You wear it. And by the way, it's safer than putting it in the bank of the ancient world because there was no such thing as a bank. So you end up putting it under your mattress. And where does the thief go? He goes right to the mattress and grabs so the woman, the lady, wears her money so she knows exactly where it is. Ten silver coins. Maybe not the most expensive, but one of them is what? Missing. So what does she do in this parable? So she loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp? Have you ever lost anything at the house? I know. I was working on the museum this week, and there was some... You see that, that fish line up there? We are using fish line for our, um, for our sound equipment to hang microphones. Well, I was looking for the fish line because I need to hang something in the museum. And I walked this complex, I think, about four miles looking for fish line. I gave up. I'm not sure it was worth it. For about $4, I'll buy some more fish line. Never mind. But I didn't want to go to the store. Walking and walking, looking, and you turn on all the lights. You're looking in different places. I look in the sound booth. I look over here. I look over there. I don't know. Maybe one of our friends at the church has decided they wanted to go fishing and took the fish line. I don't know. But all I know is there's no fish line. 
just like this lady, she's turning on the lights, or should I say lighting the candles? Sorry, Teresa, I'm going too quick. I'll slow down. She'll light the candle and look everywhere. And she'll clean. Have you ever looked for something and you end up cleaning the house? You didn't want to clean the house. But then, when you're looking, you find out, wait a minute. If I don't clean, I'm not going to find it. So that sweeping starts to happen, and she looks and cleans and cleans and cleans and searches carefully until she finds it. Verse 9. And when she finds it, what does she do? She calls her friends and her neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost, what? Coin. In the same way, I tell you that there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who, what? Repents, the change is back, that says, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to go a different way that's the good way. Have you ever thought of that when you make a choice like that? You can hear the applause in heaven. It's, it's like, it reminds me of Titanic. Remember the end of the film Titanic? It's a, one of those iconic films. I know it was about 20 some years ago. All, uh, about 20, maybe 24 years, 25 years ago. But there's the ending where they're all you're going through with the camera, the, the bottom of the ocean, and all of a sudden it changes to new. Have you remember that scene where it comes and it becomes new? And everybody, as the main characters come down, and by the way, there's enemies in that movie, but all of a sudden, all the enemies don't exist anymore, for they all were buried in common soil, like we all are. We all think we're better than each other, but we're all going to be buried in the same place, and it's Jesus that's going to save us or not, right? And so it comes, and all of a sudden, everyone applauds and begins to say, and, the, and there's the scene where the, the girl and the guy are together again, the love story, and that's the end. I see that when it comes to God. Every time someone says, I need to make a change, the amount of applause that happens, you know, that is incredible. That, that visual of Jesus. Jesus is persistent for us, for you. He pushes things out of the way. And he shoves things so that you may be in his kingdom. But there only is one thing we cannot move. He cannot move the stone that is your free will. If you do not want it, he will not force you, drag you kicking and screaming into heaven. Many universals like to talk about everyone being saved. Well, I, I'll tell you. If you got to love someone next door to you and you don't like how they are and you hate them, do you think heaven is really heaven for them? No. He's not going to drag us in kicking and screaming, but he will facilitate through the provision of his life, death, and resurrection. He will facilitate and work hard within you around you and through his church to bring each one in. And that includes people that we sometimes don't like in society, no matter what color. Or when I say we, I say it generically. It's not me. I, I would hope I would love everyone. But we're humans and we make mistakes and errors. But Jesus does not. He loves everyone. And he wants us to reach each and every one, no matter where you're from, no matter what your background, no matter what your language, origin, or even your ideology. Yes, Jesus does love those Democrats and those Republicans, even the crazies. He loves them. They're crazies on both sides, by the way. <laughs> crazies everywhere. I know we all want to think that our side is the best. Only Seventh-day Adventists are awesome. I'm a pastor. I've worked with some of these Seventh-day Adventists, right? We all have issues everywhere. Jesus loves each one of us. So now, persistence. Now I want to bring you to another persistent moment. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. 
For there was a woman, of course, caught in adultery. And I, 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 I see the clock, and I'll be quick. I see the clock, and I will be quick. But this woman is caught in adultery, and it was a sting operation. And these, this is John chapter 8. John, just after Luke. John chapter 8, starting... Uh, you know, he appeared again in the temple courts, and they brought in this woman who was caught in adultery. And apparently they dragged the woman in, but not the guy. You know why? Because the guy was a part of the sting operation. They wanted to catch Jesus and see what he says. So they throw this woman down at the temple courts and say, she has violated the law of Moses, and it says she must be stoned. And Jesus is like looking around, and he's like, I think the guy that was with her is here somewhere. In fact, he starts to write names in the dirt, and the old guys start leaving first. What does that tell you? A little Filipinos, Mahia. I'm out of here. It's, that means shame. It's like, it's like a deeper shame, though. It's like a, it's like a I, who, I'm caught. <laughs> you know, that kind of a thing. They start, Jesus writes, they leave. The older ones first, meaning the older ones probably did more things that were wrong than the younger. But then the younger ones got out of there. Then he says, who condemns you? She looks around, right and left. No one, sir. This is in verse 10. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Verse 11, Jesus, she says, no one, sir. Then Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Sometimes we stop there. Jesus is more persistent than this. He accepts us all exactly where we are. He accepts us. But love does not just merely accept and walk away. Love is unconditional. It means love now says, go your way and leave your life of what? Of sin. The very thing that it brought her to, because you know, she was brought there because she did something wrong. It doesn't matter, even though the guy that did something wrong, he got whacked as well, because I think his name was in that sand, right? He got whacked as well, but she was going to get a worse penalty. Jesus actually made them equal. He was pushed. She was pushed by them. And now he says, go your way and change. Reach for the stars, because... God pursues you, that's why. He doesn't just say, I love you just the way you are. You are great just the way you are. Done. He says, like a loving father or a loving mother says, now you got to change. And that's not fun sometimes. But that is love. The persistent love of God calls for us to change and find happiness. She was looking for happiness, could not find it, only found issues, problems. But when she came to Jesus, when she was thrown before Jesus, he gave her change. She wasn't perfect, as we see in other books it says actually about Mary that seven demons had been thrown out. So I, I don't know what that means. I think it's that Jesus met her seven times and again said, change. And you know, many times we think we give up about the first or second time. I'm a pastor. And I say, hey, man, you got to change, dude. And then at a certain point, we say, I don't care anymore because we're human. But God don't stop. Sorry for that bad English. God does not stop. He pursues you, every one of you. And he wants you in his kingdom. Amen. Do you want to be there? Amen. And more than that, 
He also calls his church, his people, meaning you and me, to call others to be a part of his kingdom. Because he loves you. He wants you to be just like him, doing the same thing he does for you and for the kingdom of heaven. One last verse. I'm going to pull you now into John chapter 15 as we end. John 15, he's praying for his disciples. And he says something amazing. John 15, I'm going to start with verse 12. Are you with me? Or did I put you to sleep? You awake? Should I have you do calisthenics? No? All right, very good. John 15, verse 12. It says, my command is this, love one another as I have what? Loved you. If you keep commandments, keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and re remain in his love. Oh, sorry, I skipped the verse. My command is this, to love one another as I have loved you. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down his life for one's or his or her friend. And then he says an amazing thing. What does he say next? You are my what? Huh? Are you a friend of God? James. Are you a friend of God? Beatrice, are you a friend of God? He's called you friend. Jolyn, are you a friend of God? He's called you friend. He said, you are my friends as you do as I command. I no longer call you my servant. Because a servant does not know his master's business. A servant just does things. And that's the legalist in all of us. God, what am I supposed to do? Let's see, i got to keep the Ten Commandments. Well, how, what about that Sabbath commandment? When, when can I pull out the video game before the sun goes? Wait a minute, God. You know, that, that's, that's servanthood. That's slavery. I'm doing it because, because, because I need to do this. I need, uh, he's not going to like me if I don't do what's right. So I'll hide it. Maybe God won't see this. Maybe mom and dad won't see this. You, you, you know how that works. But because you're my friends, we can be open and honest, Jesus says. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me. Are you listening? You did not choose Jesus. Jesus chose you. He chose you. He made you. He created you. I know this world is messed up, but that does not change anything. Because Jesus has chosen you. He loves you, and he has anointed you so that you might bear fruit that will last for eternity. And whatever you ask in my Father's name, he will grant to you. This is my command, love one another. My friends, my family, family of God, whether you know it or not, whether you're on YouTube, whether you've liked and subscribed or not, you are family. Whether you, here in this place, maybe this is one of the first times you've ever been here, or you cannot remember how many times you've been here, you are family of mine because Jesus has pursued you and wants you to be in his family. Not just today, 
I'm not a Seventh Day Adventist. I, now I'm going to get that quoted and I'm going to be in trouble. I want to be a Seventh Day Adventist. I worship on the Seventh Day, but I would hope that I'm going to live like Jesus every day. Amen. Now I'm going to mess up and I'm going to say things and do things I shouldn't do. But you know what? He pursues you. Faithful and just to forgive of sin and cleanse from unrighteousness. He will do that. What I'm asking for you is, are you in the family? Are you willing to be a part of the family of God? You are pursued, and therefore, you begin to pursue others for him. You think you can live like that? God bless you.